All right. Well, first of all, welcome everyone for attending our webinar series today. We're so excited to host another episode of the IMA Student Series Accounting and Finance Professional Panel. So this is our fifth time holding this event, uh, and each time the turnout's been really great. This one we had over a thousand uh, students and even faculty register for this, and we know there's several faculty that will be showing this to their classes afterwards or their uh, student accounting club. So we're really grateful to have you with us today, and uh, we're looking forward to th this discussion. So one of the questions that was asked is, will this session be recorded? So we will be recording it. Mary and I will be sending out an email shortly after this, but you'll also be getting another one from IMA uh, later on this week that has a little bit more information. Also, as a reminder, if you could all make sure that you're on mute, um, you should have been muted as you came into the room, but just double check that you're muted so we don't have any eruptions or any distractions for our panelists today. So before we get started, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for today's webinar, Lyme Exam Prep. Lyme Exam Prep has helped accountants pass millions of certification exams since 1974. Lyme is an IMA strategic partner, the exclusive course provider for IMA's CMA scholarship program, and a proud sponsor of this webinar. Family owned and operated from the beginning, Lyme is committed to helping you pass your CMA exam and achieve professional success. So once again, thank you, Lyme, for sponsoring today's webinar. So we'll start off with introductions. My name is Tyler Skelton and joining me today is my colleague, Mary Patterson. Mary and I work on our academic outreach team at IMA. So we work with colleges and universities in the entire United States to promote the CMA certification and also other resources that IMA has to help you get career ready. And one of the reasons we do this webinar is we want you to know about the different opportunities that are out there in accounting. It's not just going into audit attacks, which is a good fit for some, but there are so many possibilities out there. And uh, by holding this webinar, we wanna show you the different opportunities. So that's what you're gonna hear today from our panelists. Uh, a little bit more about us. So I'm based out of the Seattle area. I work with schools that are in the Western US shown in purple on the map you see on the screen. And then Mary is based out of Pittsburgh and works with schools in the Eastern US shown in blue. So if you have any questions or you would like to schedule a CMA to speak to your classroom or speak to your student club, reach out to either one of us and we'd be happy to help coordinate that. So let's look at today's agenda and it's going to be very simple. So I'll be giving a quick overview of IMA and the CMA certification. And then right after that, we'll get into the panel discussion. And Mary will be our moderator today asking the panelists several questions. At the end, we will have some time to take questions from the audience, but throughout the webinar, our team will be monitoring the chat. So if you do have questions, be sure to enter those into the chat. And if you have any questions for a specific panelist, make sure that you uh, put their name in the chat and uh, we'll try to get answer all those questions along the way. And Mary, you and, have to Yeah, one thing, when you wanna ask a question, do not send it directly to me, just send it to everyone because we have a few people monitoring it. I probably won't see it if you send it directly to me. Just saying that. So we also wanted to take a minute to share how far along this webinar series has come over the last five times we've done this. So as I mentioned, this is our fifth installment and we've received a lot of great feedback for this program, which is why we continue to hold this twice a year. So we're always trying to improve this. So later on this week, when you receive the email uh, from IMA, there's a feedback survey. Make sure you fill that out so we can make any tweaks to this. Or if there's something else that you want to hear, let us know because we want to make sure that this is uh, the best that we can make this for you as students. So after this panel is finished, uh, we'll send out the recording um, and then you can actually head over to our YouTube page and watch the other previous uh, four previous recordings that we have. And the QR code in the upper right hand corner, that will take you directly to our YouTube page where these are housed. So once we uh, have a little bit of time to uh, get the recording of this video and make a couple edits, we'll be posting that to YouTube. But like I said, Mary and I will be sending uh, at least the Zoom recording immediately after this webinar is over. Uh, but I also wanted to point out, so since we've uh, done this a few times now, uh, I wanted to point out some of the panelists and companies and different positions that we've had on in the past um, that are available for accounting and finance graduates. So this doesn't include all of our panelists, but we just wanted to highlight a few uh, companies and titles from those companies. So uh, all of our panelists that have been on so far have been CMAs and some hold other credentials as well, They're like the C CPA, some have both the CMA and CPA. Uh, but we always try to find a nice mix of companies and panelists for you to hear from. So uh, we've had people from Dell Technologies, uh, an accounting senior advisor. We've had someone 
that is a cost a manager of cost accounting at DoorDash. We've had someone that's a tax associate at KPMG. You'll see Tesla on here. Uh, Love Every is a, a small startup company looking to IPO here within the next year or two. We've had someone uh, from there that's a controller and someone from Nike, a global operations manager. So maybe not your typical accounting title, but someone that works more on the logistics and operations sides of things. But uh, the, the main goal of this is the analytical and quantitative skills that you have are in demand. And through this webinar, we'd like to share some examples of the diverse and exciting career paths available to you. So we hope that you enjoy today's session. So we'll first start off just talking a little bit about IMA. IMA is a global association with more than 140,000 members who are accounting and finance professionals working in business. Our organization has more than 300 professional and student chapters located in cities and campuses around the world. So this creates a great networking opportunity. And we wanna stress this to you as students by joining IMA, you're connecting with professionals that are local to your city, your state, or even your region. Uh, and these are people that are working in, in industry and they're great to connect with because you never know what sort of career opportunities can come from, from that connection. I know one example uh, of a member of ours who was getting his MBA in China and he actually was able to join the local chapter there. So being thousands and thousands of miles from home, he was still able to go to the IMA community of the local chapter in China. So it really is a global network and community and a really great reason to join IMA. So IMA also offers the CMA certification, which stands for Certified Management Accountant, which is the global standard in management accounting. And on top of that, we have a number of other career enhancing resources that are available to help get you career ready. And we'll be talking about some of those resources here shortly. So this slide here, I don't wanna scare anyone away. I'm just gonna give you a high level overview of the, the CMA exam and the test topics. Most of you are probably already familiar with the exam, but I wanted to quickly run through the two parts here. So uh, the CMA is composed of two parts, testing your fluency in both accounting and finance. Uh, the exams are each four hours in length. You'll start off with 100 multiple choice questions and conclude with two essay scenarios for each part. So those are essentially like many cases. Part one is called financial planning, performance, and analytics. It, you'll see it has six sections. So it'll cover different financial statements, a budgeting process, variance analysis. You'll see best practices and internal controls, and then data analytics. So a lot of what you're seeing in this part of the exam will, will come from your cost and managerial courses. It'll come from your intermediate financial accounting classes. And then as we look at part two, this is called strategic financial management. It has six sections and you'll see that this includes some finance topics. So it'll cover things like financial ratios, risk and return models, variable and fixed costs, best practices in enterprise risk management, uh, capital budgeting techniques. And you'll also see ethics is listed on that as well. So hopefully these sound familiar to you and the content is very relevant. So uh, you know, I'm sure our panelists will tell you that it's very important to have a mastery of these skills because this is actually reflected of what you'll be doing in your in your work. The exam parts can be taken in any order. So I know uh, we might have some finance students that are on here and might feel stronger on the finance side of thing. You can start with part two or uh, if you just finished an advanced financial course, you can go ahead and start with part one. It doesn't matter which order you take the exam. Um, you can also take the exam while you're still in school, and we encourage you to do that because a lot of the topics that you're learning will show up on the exam. So again, just a quick high level overview, and I uh, just wanted to share some of the topics. And like I said, hopefully these look familiar to you. So if there's one thing, at least of my portion that you take away from this presentation is uh, our CMA scholarship program. So this is a really great program where IMA offers 10 scholarships per year at every four year college or university. And you'll see that the scholarship covers three years of IMA membership. It'll cover the fees, the entry fee into the CMA exam program. It'll cover registration fees for both parts of the exam. And also you'll receive 12 months of access to the GLIME CMA study materials, which you'll notice is our sponsor for today's webinar. And it's so generous of GLIME to be able to provide those study materials as a part of the CMA scholarship. So uh, once again, thank you GLIME for doing that. And the, the only stipula stipulation for this program is that you must be nominated by a faculty member from your school. Uh, but this is going to give you an opportunity to earn a professional certification while you're still in school and best of all, pay zero out of your pocket. So be sure to let your professors know. You can always uh, copy uh, Mary or myself on an email if they need more information about the program, but uh, definitely be sure to let your professors know about that. 
So one of the other great benefits of being a student member of IMA is you could take several of our courses at no cost. And we wanted to sh show two of our more popular courses uh, that students are taking. So we have our data analytics and visualization fundamental certificate and our robotics process automation or RPA series. So these courses are meant to give you a foundational understanding of these topics. And what's nice about them is when you complete each course, you'll receive a professional certificate from IMA and a digital badge that you can add to your LinkedIn profile. So we've heard from a number of students, this is a great talking point when they're talking to a recruiter or a hiring manager and they're saying, hey, what's this data analytics course that you took? And uh, it's a really great, a great course to have. And um, again, building that knowledge and skill set because these, these topics, these skills are not going away anytime soon. And then in addition to these, these courses, we have other free courses available um, in technology and analytics. We have soft skills, uh, several other different courses that are free to our student members. And I know we have some academic members on, those are also free to you as well. So Mary, if you could put the, the student membership link in the chat, um, it should automatically reduce the membership price to $25 from 45 to 25. But if not, you can use the code student22, which you'll see on the screen, and that'll knock that down to $25. But uh, like I said, the, both of these courses are a great way to build your knowledge and skill set, and it's going to set you apart from your peers. So we hope you take advantage of those. And finally, before we get started, we wanted to let you know about our student leadership conference coming up uh, November 9th through 11th in Detroit. Uh, we actually just had our first in-person student leadership conference in Pittsburgh uh, this last fall. It was the first time in three years we had an in-person student leadership conference, and it was, it was a really great event. Now, this might seem like it's a, a ways away, but we want you to start getting the thought in your head. Put this in your calendar. We know it takes time to you know, fundraise and get funding. Talk to your department chairs. Uh, another reason why it's important to, to join a student chapter is a lot of times they have funding available for students to go. So, uh, you know, we wanted to give you plenty of time to start planning that out, but we hope to see you there. These are really great events. We have uh, professional speakers from a variety of different industries. We have uh, industry tours. So in Pittsburgh, I was lucky enough to get to go to the Pittsburgh Penguins and go on a tour and learn about the facilities and uh, meet with their accounting and finance team. So we'll be doing those industry tours. Uh, we had a, a really fun uh, student night at the end of it that wrapped up with games and, and food. And uh, also there's a career fair where there's a, a number of different companies that will be attending for internships and uh, potential job opportunities. And uh, we have a couple of students in the past that have, uh, have, have received job offers from attending this. So we hope to see you there. And if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to us. So with that being said, let's go ahead and meet today's panel. Uh, so for today's we webinar, we have a fantastic panel of accounting and finance professionals joining, joining us to share their insights and experience. So let's get started to meet our panelists. And you'll notice that they are all CMAs. So uh, congratulations on that. Uh, first, we have Yana Abramenko. <laughs> Yana is a senior finance manager at Amazon. Uh, next, we have Tony Capobianco. Tony is a senior manager, FP&A ad sales at Barstool Sports. Next, we have Keith Lewis. Keith is an associate ops tech finance at JP Morgan Chase and Company. And finally, we have Daniel Williams. Daniel is a se senior financial analyst at Johnson & Johnson. So that's our panel for today. And uh, I'm sure you're excited as, as I am to hear from them. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Mary, I'll turn it over to you and I'll just double check that they are all spotlighted, which it looks like they are. I think we're good right. to stop sharing my screen here. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so we're going to get into the panel. Um, and again, as Tyler mentioned, while you're listening to your our panelists, if you have a question, put it in the chat. We have someone monitoring that. And we'll hopefully get to as many questions from the audience as we can. But let's jump into that. So the first question that we have is, would you briefly describe your career since graduating from your undergrad and provide some details about your current company and your responsibilities within your role? So, for example, I think everyone on this call is familiar with Amazon, but they might not necessarily understand what a senior finance manager does at Amazon. So with that, Yana, I'll let you start and explain kind of where you how you got to where you are today. You're on mute. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Amazing. So I'm really glad being here. Um, this type of events are super energizing. So my name is Jana. I've been um, 16 years with finance profession now. So I graduated back in 2007. And I, I, I'm originally from Russia, from Siberia, from a small Siberian town. Uh, at the time I graduated, I started my career with PNG, Procter and Gamble in Russia. And I grew there in a decade from a finance analyst working in FP&A in, 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 in financial planning and analysis there uh, up to being a director uh, for the, um, what is called GL, general ledger, right? Financial reporting, we can call it this way. So during these 10 years, like PNG has a really great uh, rotation type of um, program. So I've spent two years in classical financial planning and analysis. I spent five years in what is called sales finance there, working with distributors, working with the sales teams and uh, making sure that the company's value proposition is being sold successfully. And then I spent two years working with the accounting team and I had a, I've been managing a team of 60 there. So after that, uh, our family uh, relocated to the US and I kind of followed my family here. And it happened to be that I went to go to the startup and uh, I spent about five years with a technology startup in the mortgage industry and ended up being a CFO there, helped them raising funds, helped them sell to the publicly traded player and then decided to, what will I do? So I changed from a tiny startup to the biggest startup of the world being Amazon. It happened about, yeah, it happened about a year ago, last April. So, and I'm here being senior finance manager at sales with sales finance. This is Amazon business. So this is Amazon part, which is selling to businesses. Everything businesses need like procurement, they need paper, they will go and sell and buy at Amazon. They need, um, garbage bins they will go and buy the amazon like uh, they need computer they will go and buy the amazon so all type of procurement and direct procurement we also call it that's part of our business you won't believe it it's a really huge team owning a separate site um, and a lot of engineers supporting it and a big sales organization which is selling to the to, to the to the customers my business is commercial and public sectors it's about 10 billion dollar business I'm responsible for PNL, so basically to making sure that the sales are profitable and that we grow at a fast rate. Uh, working day to day, doing customer deals with my team. Uh, what else? Like making sure that our sales organization is very efficient. Wonderful. Thank you. So that was great. I think that's a part of Amazon that even I didn't know that they did. So that was great to hear. Um, I'll move over to Keith. So tell me a little bit about your career and where you're at today. Absolutely. So first I'll start off, I'm a native New Yorker. Um, I live in Philly, but I'm a Giants fan. So it was kind of um, heartbreaking this year. Um, so funny enough, although I have my degree in finance, my career actually started off more in accounting. Uh, so I worked in New York as a staff accountant, moved up to a senior accountant and decided I was gonna move to Pennsylvania to work in financial services, possibly to change of career. I didn't like it, worked there for a year within financial services and then I moved over to finance and accounting. And I just enjoyed working with numbers, working with variance analysis, things of that nature. So it was just something I took to. And currently at JP Morgan Chase, I'm working directly with the finance ops team and the tech team. So I support the CTOs and their lines of business, making sure that they're budgeting and financing properly and taking into account all of the new technologies and subscriptions that are coming up and keeping us in budget. That's the, that's the main thing. Wonderful. And Tony at Barstools, I'll move over to you. Uh, first, I just wanna thank Mary, uh, Lisa and Tyler for putting this all together. I think it's great. i um, really happy to be a part of this. Um, Yana has an amazing experience. It's hard to follow up all of that. Um, but so um, I'll just start. So in college, I, I went to Syracuse University, um, went there as a dual major in chemical engineering and chemistry. So I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest with you. I did not like chemistry that much, um, but I, I was good at science. 
uh, knew I wanted to get into business. My GPA wasn't that great due to being an engineering student for a little bit. So I struggled a little bit to get into the business school. Uh, however, because I was in the arts and science, economics was kind of my fallback to get into business. Uh, so went studied economics, minored in psychology, uh, came out of college with no job, uh, but an aspiration to get into a finance role. So I was applying to pretty much every entry level finance role out there, um, which probably isn't the best strategy. You probably want to know a little bit more like what you want to do. So it took a little bit for me to get like an opportunity for myself. Uh, after about like two months, I was working with just construction, just applying for jobs every day. Uh, an opportunity through my network came up and that was to be a financial analyst for complex media. So this was kind of my entryway into the corporate finance space. Uh, started there in July of 2018. And that's kind of where I fell in love with FP&A and managing a business and kind of understanding P&Ls and financial statements and all that stuff. So uh, after a year, that's when I kind of thought, all right, how can I get to the next level? Because I felt like I was kind of a step behind everyone, not knowing accounting as strong as I could. Uh, that's when I studied the CMA. So the CMA, while studying for that, as well as kind of working my way up at Complex, eventually got my CMA, simultaneously became manager of FPNA there, uh, which eventually led to my opportunity at Barstool. So Barstool reached out to me after about three years of working at Complex to be the manager of FPNA ad sales here. Uh, a little different than Complex. So Complex, I was helping manage the whole business, so seeing every piece of the uh, p l whereas here I'm just focused on ad sales. So my jobs really is kind of like Keith, where like I'm responsible for kind of just the p l budgeting, forecasting, um, making sure that we're, you know, working our way towards our budget. And if not, you know, what are the steps you have to take to get back there? Um, and then on top of that, just like process improvement, working with accounting a lot, uh, working with teams across the entire company that kind of get related to ad sales and, uh, you know, Honestly, like educating people on how finance kind of works and how everything's kind of connected. It all comes back to finance. Uh, so the CMA definitely helps with that because it pretty much teaches you how the entire business operates. Um, so leveraging that like every day at Barstool. Um, but yeah, that sums it up. Great. Um, something that I love that you said, Tony, and I think there's a lot of students on this panel that are probably in the same position of you. So I'm just going to apply everywhere and I don't know what's going to happen. And then isn't it funny years down, all of a sudden companies start reaching out to you for opportunities. So I think that's something all the students can take away from this is, you know, once you have that background and you have that experience and those certifications next to your name, then the companies start finding you. So that's something, especially for those seniors where life is getting real, um, that's a good thing to kind of highlight with that. Absolutely. And last but certainly not least, uh, Danielle, would you briefly describe your career to this date? Yes, um, thank you guys for, for having me here. I'm excited to, to talk to you guys and um, give you guys a little bit about my, my career experience. Um, so I feel like my journey has been a little bit more direct. I went to Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and I, I man majored in finance. Um, and then coming out of college, I actually joined Johnson & Johnson's FLDP program, so Finance Leadership Development Program, um, which was a two-year rotational um, program throughout the company. So I had really great experience um, being able to um, work in different parts of the company very early on in my career as an analyst. Um, and then after that, I graduated the program and had a few senior roles leading up to my current position where I currently support our pharmaceutical um, sector of the company, um, their research and development part. So in my day-to-day -day job, currently I'm dealing with a lot of scientists and you know operational folks and people with multiple PhDs. So it's really awesome and cool to kind of be in that space and an area that I never thought um, I would ever be in and you know get to talk about potential drugs and you know life-saving, you know, concoctions that could help people down um, later in the future. And my main responsibility right now is kind of budget and uh, budget analysis. So I help with the forecasting, um, as well as comparing actuals and making sure that we're aligned with the company's goals in the future. So. Great. Thank you so much with that. So 
we're gonna, my next question is gonna be, what inspired you to get your CMA or who, who, how did you even find out about it? Was it a professor? Was it something you found later on in your professional career? Um, and I'll jump to you, Tony. I think you already started to talk about that a little bit, but just give us a little more. Yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, after one year working as a financial analyst uh, and seeing that that's the career path I kind of want to go on was financial planning and analysis. Um, and again, realizing I, I probably could use a little bit more knowledge about accounting and financial statements and analysis and decision making and all of that stuff. Uh, so I started researching all these different certifications. Um, a, a few of my friends have other professional certifications, but they weren't really aligning with what I was doing or like my goals for my career. Um, and so found the CMA, found a couple people that actually had the CMA, reached out to them. Uh, they had, you know, we had good conversations about what they were doing and how a lot of the things you learn in the CMA are super practical, which honestly, like that was kind of the draw for me was if I'm going to study for something, I hopefully take things from that I could use in my day to day, like almost immediately. So, um, you know, that kind of pushed me to do it. Uh, I knew it was going to be a lot of work based on the research. It's like, I think it was like 300 hours of studying or something like that. Um, which sounds daunting, but uh, it's it's really not that bad. And you, the return on investment with that is like insane. Like your work ethic changes. Uh, you just understand basic like analytics and how businesses operate. And it's super useful information. So, um, you know, I'm happy that I fell in love with the career very early in my career. I know that doesn't happen for a lot of people. Um, but with the CMA, I mean, kind of can be applied to any job. It can help you in any kind of way because you're just understanding things as, as like holistically. So um, yeah, that's pretty much Perfect. it. And how about you, Danielle? Yep. Um, so when I first joined j, j I was a part of our pharmaceutical supply chain group. Um, so that is actually a very cost accounting, heavy technical, like, accounting role um, within j, j So finance is kind of like a misnomer. It's it's kind of a blend of finance and accounting. Um, so like I mentioned, I was a finance major. I only really had two accounting classes um, when I went through college. So I kind of pushed all of that <laughs> to the back of my head, being quite honest. Um, so when I got into the role, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't, like I need to find a way to refresh this. Um, and j, j is actually a really big proponent for the CMA. They actually really encourage people to get it. Um, so because of that, that's how I learned about the CMA and then learned a little bit more and realized that this could help me kind of become like a well-rounded analyst in my role. So I studied for it and then realized as I was studying, it kind of helped me click like some concepts that I was actually doing in my job and kind of made it easier for me. Um, so that was kind of the point where I was like, okay, I'll, I'll definitely see this out and, and you know, make sure I, I complete the exams and get the certification. So great. And Yana, what made you want to get your CMA? My path is, um, is, is close to the j, &J uh, path. Uh, Procter & Gamble has been a big supporter, and I think they are still a big supporter of, of CMA. And after my first year of working with them, they just offered it um, and paid for the classes. And it was really fun because when they are like three or four like you know colleagues uh, but we were very young at the time and we really kind of attended classes together and motivated each other to to make the exams I'm a little bit a dinosaur here I still passed the four part exam so it was four part four hours each so basically it took a while for us and it was an effort frankly not everyone basically did it at the time some people just you know jumped off uh, along the way I finally did it and I was very happy uh, I should say I underestimated the value of CMA then, but after that, in five years from the point, I really picked myself very often on the concepts and especially on the concepts which are not finance specific, but which were a little bit on the side, like internal controls, like ethics, like financing. When you become a little more senior in the organization, you, start, you, you, you need some type of you need some type of compass, you know, as a finance to follow. And I really believe that the well-rounded program of CMA gave me a lot of it, even though unconsciously, I first didn't fully understand how much it gave me. Great. And Keith, how did you find it? Uh, I think actually it was one of my college mates when we graduated. 
uh, graduated from Pace University. I knew that I didn't want to go in the direction of the big four accounting firms. I didn't know where I wanted to land in terms of companies, um, but I knew that going into one of the big four, and at that time, I think it was like ENY, KPMG, Deloitte, some of the major players that are still around now, but he had mentioned this certification that actually worked more with the analysis of data and information. And that's kind of like what sparked, I guess, the intrigue there. And as I started to go through the process, and it was coupled with the fact that I was working in the field as well. So a lot of the material and a lot of the things that I was learning was applicable right within the organization. So I was able to apply a lot of it while I was learning the material, which helped me really understand the conceptual pieces of it and everything along those lines, which I think helped when I went to sit for the exam because I had real world practical experience in working with it and, and studying the material. Great, and I, I guess I'll kind of piggyback on that um, and I'll start with you, Keith, but can you give any examples of specific CMA concepts and skills that you're actually using on the job today or have been have used in the past? Well, I'm budgeting financing is what <laughs> I do <laughs> every day, pretty much. And, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, pulling teeth, you know, depending on who you're speaking to, because like, uh, like Tony was saying, it's not that a lot of people are creatives and they're in their space and you, you have to respect that they have a profession and that they're good at what they do. And the finance piece is just the piece that comes after. You're just here to pay for what it is that I need to do in order to execute on this great idea or this great plan. And they tend to think of that afterwards as opposed to thinking about it in the beginning. And I noticed that, you know, just through my career working at SEI, um, at JP now, a lot of it comes down to really building those relationships across the different lines of business so that so that way they don't look at us as the person that has the stick in the hand that's ready to, to knock the hand down and say, you can't spend it. It's more about how can we partner? How can we work together in order to get what it is that you want, as well as being able to work in terms of what the organization wants and help us grow? And I think that that's one of the big things with the CMA is that I always thought strategically um, throughout my career, but I think after attaining the CMA, I tend to think a lot more strategically about, okay, what is the end game with what we're doing? What's the point of us doing it? And how can we execute on it the best way? That's great. Honestly, Keith, that came up in a couple other student series about how cross-functionally you have to work with the other people and understand their part of the business, but be able to explain what the budgeting part on your side is. So I think that's something that students don't really understand while they're in school, but it becomes a major thing that you do once you start working. So that, that's wonderful. Um, Yana, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but some more CMA concepts that you deal with on a daily basis. I'll tell you one, which I, which is just snow, which came into like, came into me from CMA and it's always with me and it always resonates with CMA, it's segregation of duties. That's funny, but when I was, when I was a finance analyst, internal controls was something that was so far from me and from my life. And it, it was very hard for me to learn this one. But when I kind of came into the, you know, management position in the accounting and I really started kind of building processes, that was something I went back to the book, you know, read it again. And it really kind of clicked how important it was from the very beginning. Even though like, I, I know I wouldn't have been kind of able to start up that quickly if I d wouldn't have had that basis in, in my past. But other than that, like in everyday life, I would just kind of echo um, other presenters. It's business partnership, the ability to think strategically. It's, um, Financial analysis, right, and the routine mechanical financial analysis, but it needs to be very high quality. And when you need to kind of, when you come to the new organization, especially, which doesn't have as set up standards of financial, financial as p &G, for example, has, and you need to set it up for your organization, it's really great to kind of go back to, go back to basics and set a benchmark 
which is needed to be set for the new organization, for the startup organization. That's, that's something I used a lot in, in, in my experience. Great. And how about you, Danielle? Um, I would agree that internal controls is definitely a big one. Um, but I would say at J&J, &J, like one of the big things that we have is our credo. Um, and that aligns a lot with the ethics kind of part of the CMA. And I felt like that definitely was what resonated. Um, just being an ethical like accountant analysis, understanding like what your responsibilities are and like what kind of like weight you have, um, I think is very important. And I love that the CMA kind of like hammers that home and make sure that like that is a piece that you understand um, because I feel like we need to have that integrity. We are holding a very important piece of the company. It might not seem like that, especially to other people like Keith and you know Yana mentions like other parts of the company, they're just trying to get their parts done. They don't really want to talk to finance too much until they need something from us. Um, but I feel like we do have a great responsibility. And I think it's really important for us to kind of like realize that and understand and be able to apply it. Great. And Tony, sorry, I know you're taking a drink, but you have anything to add to that? Um, well, definitely the budgeting, forecasting and you know, financial analysis is everything that my job is. Um, I mean, I know from when I was at Complex, building a lot of the financial models and kind of just understanding how costs work, I think that was very useful. Uh, indirect, direct costs, variable, fixed, like having, having an understanding of how all that works, you're going to carry that throughout like your entire career, especially when you're doing FP&A or corporate finance. Um, I know at, at Barstool, now it's less about the modeling here, but it's more about understanding processes and how the departments work, but then trying to understand the decisions they're making and how that impacts another decision going on simultaneously and how that might impact the PL or the forecast or the budget, like always trying to connect it back to the budget or the, or the income statement, whatever it may be. Um, so just having the, the knowledge of how it all operates and works and ties and moves and levers and everything like that, um, it's extremely useful. Um, so, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think everyone kind of touched on everything, but from a modeling standpoint, Excel modeling and all that stuff, uh, you definitely want to leverage all of like the analysis and decision making type stuff you learn from the CMA. Great. Um, and since we're talking about the CMA, th this will be for Danielle and Tony, because I think you were the ones that have passed the CMA most recently. Um, but just give us a little bit of insight in how you prepared for the CMA and any study tips that you would like to share to the students. And then I always like, or is there something, if you could do it differently, what would you do? So Danielle, I'll start with you. Yep, definitely. Um, well, to study, I used the Glime products. I, I, I will say they really helped me a lot. Um, I used the textbooks. Um, I used the online materials. So that really helped. I went through all of the lessons and kind of just made sure I understood. Like before I moved on, I understood what the topics were and what, what was going on in that section, um, as well as the practice test. Definitely do the practice test and actually try and time yourself because that's very important. Um, and if I were to do anything different, I feel like I would definitely start with um, part two first, the like financial. I was focused on the accounting part um, and I feel like that kind of stressed me out a little bit. So I feel like if I just did the financial part where I was more comfortable, where I like, you know, had my expertise um, and kind of like got my confidence up and, you know, took the exam there, um, I feel like that definitely would have helped. So just like make sure you're in the most comfortable position and you're setting yourself up for success. So that's what I would do differently. But um, the materials that I used, I, I feel like they were more than efficient to help me pass the exams. Great. And yeah, that's something to highlight here. So for the accounting majors, uh, how Tyler showed that to you, part one is more of that accounting focus part of the exam. That's usually where the accounting major starts. And then our finance majors usually start with part two, because that's where they feel most comfortable. All right, Tony, um, tell me how you prepared for the exam and any tips or things you would do differently. Yeah, so I didn't have the accounting uh, background, so and I was doing economics, not really finance. So I went, I went with the part one first, uh, based on the research I did. It was like do part one, we get a good base knowledge of that. Going into part two, it'd probably be easier doing it that way. Um, even though I didn't do as well in part two, so I don't know if that actually worked. Um, but so basically, my my method was give myself a lot of time. Um, I think I gave myself six months in the first. Uh, two and a half months, roughly, it was just me figuring out what's the best way for me to study. Because I'm not saying I didn't study a lot in college. I studied, definitely. But 
I definitely didn't figure out the best ways I could study in college. So um, a lot of cramming, you know, you know, I don't have to get into that, but basically um, <laughs> two months of me just figuring out the best way to study, no cards, reading, actual like writing in the book, highlighting, taking all the quizzes uh, by when there was like four months left, roughly, that's when I really like, all right, let me just study every day, set two hours a day, maybe four to six hours on the weekends or whatever it may be to kind of get to that 150 hour mark for each part. Um, well, again, a lot of the research I was looking at was saying, if you could just put in the time and the effort, you just get to those hours, you'll, you're going to pass the exam. So that's right. a simple formula. I mean, that's a simple, you know, I'll just get to the hours and I'll probably feel, feel good going to the exam. Um, but yeah, I mean, what Danielle was saying, do all the practice exams, uh, more, as many exams as possible. I think that's probably like the best advice, like exams, exam, exams. Um, if you have to like buy other like study materials outside of what you're using, like I would suggest doing that, um, especially if you're feeling like you're not learning enough, you're not getting it, just really hammer the exams. Um, and again, I think the giving yourself more than enough time to study and kind of get into the swing of things is, is the best thing to do. Great. Mary, I had a, a question come up a couple times. Were there any classes that you took that really helped you with the CMA that you can recall? Or any classes you wish you would have taken? Yeah, any accounting class I wish I would have <laughs> taken. <laughs> um, but yeah, accounting and finance. I mean, I was just all econ and psych. So <laughs> the, the, the econ concepts were very good in shaping the way I think. Um, but it, it was it didn't help that much going into studying for the CMA. So, yeah. I, I did take a review class with uh, Villanova for both parts of the CMA. After I felt like I was at a point where I'd studied a lot of the material, I did do a review class, which was, I believe it was about five to six weeks. And it kind of like answered a lot of those questions that I was having on my own. So I was, it was very helpful. Right. Um, so I want to ask this question to Yana and Danielle. Um, how do you see the role of a CMA evolving in the future? And how do you stay up to date with um, developments that are going on in the field? So how do you stay relevant with knowing what's happening in the market? So I'll start with you, Yana. What do you see as the CMA? How's it, how is it going to evolve? Um. CMA will become more and more important, right? With everyone going virtual, with a lot of education going virtual, uh, and with, uh, with like more and more people will become uh, really great financial professionals without maybe even the need to do their first major, you know, in the university. So it kind of opens up a lot of opportunities, but also the role of finance evolves in terms of like, being more strategic, not only counting, right? Going from accounting reporting into strategic and partnership role. And that's what CMA promotes a lot and, and, and sets the basics a lot. CMA is also evolving big time in technology and analytics, which is kind of um, the, you know, kind of it's, it's already the future, which is becoming a reality right now. I can tell you my whole team right now can SQL. And without sequeling, they cannot get the data they need uh, for uh, to, to be able to do their financial analysis. So with the technology companies becoming really basic requirement. So you not only need to do Excel and being able to present your ideas in a great way, but you also need to be able to manipulate data, understand data and understand data structures. So CMA is one of rare uh, financial courses and financial systems, which is giving you these really well-rounded uh, basic basis. Uh, another really great thing I feel about CMA is counting and finance and strategy and right technology. Like it's all coming well together in my whole experience. I never felt that it's an issue for me to jump off from finance to accounting or from accounting to finance. I'll give you one. Go on mute. Oh, that's great, Donna. Um, I actually want to jump to, and I love how you said about the data analytics and how that is becoming the future. And Tyler mentioned those courses that we have available that are for free for student members of IMA. Um, but I also want to move on to some other questions. So, Tony. 
Um, I'm going to ask this to you because you are working for a company, Barstool Sports, which I'm sure a lot of students on this call are familiar with. It's obviously a relatively new company. Um, what would students be most surprised about as someone that is working for Barstool Sports? Um, well, <clears throat> I think a lot of people uh, just see like the output of Barstool, like all the content and all the craziness and whatever is going on on you know Twitter, Instagram, and stuff like that. They think that's kind of like represents the, the, the back office business side of it as well. Um, so I think they'd be surprised if they came in the office and saw if they walked to the floor that I'm on. It's all very like a little more corporate, a little bit more like serious, like high energy, fast pace, like solving problems, decision making, all that stuff. It's very like very much like a, a strong uh, work ethic culture. Um, now, it does come with like if you're walking in the office and like a camera will spot, like by you and ask you to get on camera and talk like that may happen. Uh, I ended up on a podcast for like 10 minutes. Um, I've been on video a few times. Um, so it definitely keeps it a little bit exciting. Um, but I think they'd be surprised to see like there's a lot of like hardworking people supporting what we're actually creating. So, yeah. So at the end of the day, you're still supporting the business the same as Danielle, Keith, and Yana, right? Right, right. Okay, great. Um, Keith, so you're getting your MBA at Temple University, and I know there's a lot of students that are considering getting their MBA or they're already enrolled in some sort of a master's class. Um, you're doing a concentration in data analytics. So what made you decide to do that, and what are you learning? And tell us a little bit about that decision. Got it. First off, go Owls, right? Temple <laughs> Owls. Um, yeah, so I decided that I was going to go for more of the technology path. I think from a finance and accounting perspective, I felt pretty comfortable, especially after getting my CMA in that, in that bucket. And I felt that now the lines between finance and technology are very blurred. Um, I think that you'll see a lot of financial professionals as Yana mentioned, knows how to do, run SQL queries. They know how to data mine, things of that nature. And I, I felt like that's the next trajectory of where we're going. So I wanted to make sure that I was getting ahead of the curve. So I decided I was going to do the data and analytics. I just finished, actually, an MIS class I did um, beginning of the fall, uh, which was an accelerated class where we talked about IoT, um, a lot of technologies, and most importantly to everybody right now, or sh should be very important, is the AWS cloud, which a lot of companies are just kind of clamoring to, whether it's AWS, whether it's Microsoft, whether it's Oracle, the cloud is, is everywhere. Um, I'm currently preparing for an AWS certification in cloud technology. I think that that's really where a lot of the where I'm seeing a lot of the chatter going on. Um, it's the cloud, it is blockchain, and how can they utilize that, that technology in order to do transactions or to do contracts in a quicker way, right? And to be able to have some type of track record and a trail that anybody can see that's a part of that actual um, transaction. And then finally, the other part of it is chat GPT, right? Which is huge right now, just was purchased by Microsoft. And a lot of companies are starting to think about how can we use this AI technology? For a long time, I would say over the past couple of years, it's been a buzzword, machine learning, AI, but nobody really understood how they were going to really use it within an organization. And I think now companies are really starting to make moves towards utilizing it in a way to grow their business. In addition to that, I've actually decided I'm probably going to move more to the innovation technology um, area, which is more about the implementation of the technology. So it's not only just the data and analysis piece of it, but it's how is this going to affect our company if we decide to bring this technology into it? How is it going to affect what we're doing? What's going to be the cost associated with it? And I think that that's a, a very interesting space as well that's starting to grow. That's great. Um, and I think that's, it's interesting for the students listening, you know, accounting, finance students, business students. I mean, this is where 
the future is going. So I think it goes back to another question. I would say if there's any classes on your campus that they are starting to offer with this technology, those are the classes that you're going to want to take as much as you can. Um, so Tyler, are there any questions that have come in through the chat while we still have the time to yeah, we've had a few. Uh, one of the questions that came up was um, for the panel. Uh, I don't know which panelists, maybe each can give a quick answer, maybe one or two, but um, how have you used your CMA skills on the job and can you provide any examples of that? I think we asked that earlier um, with what they were doing. Okay. I, know I saw um, what someone said, a lot of the focus, especially for them as students, is the big four coming to campus, but how do you get into those industry positions? Is there any advice you would give to students? Sometimes they, they're they not coming to their campus, so how do you get into that part? So anyone can pick up with that. LinkedIn, <laughs> that, is, that is, I always say when I, when I speak to students, LinkedIn is like your blank canvas and you can paint whatever picture you want. Of course, you want to make sure it's an accurate picture, right? Because if your LinkedIn don't tie to your Instagram, don't tie to your resume, you know, you're going to have a problem from that perspective. But I think that LinkedIn provides you the opportunity to really show what talents you have, what your aspirations are. And in addition to that, just cold calling, which I have done in the past, so I'm dating myself to a certain extent. <laughs> That was about picking up a phone call or shooting an email to somebody. You don't have to do it in that type of way anymore. Now you can reach out to people on LinkedIn, reach out to people like myself, like Danielle, Yana, and just say, hey, you know what? I'm interested in this particular career path. I see you're at a company that I'm of interest of. And I just want to know what your journey was, how you got there, right? And you'll be surprised how many people will actually respond to that email and will give you insight on things that they've done and maybe even be interested to actually bring you on as a mentee and kind of show you some of the ropes that they've learned. So utilize LinkedIn as well as um, Glassdoor is starting to grow as well. Great, and for everyone that's on this, we did provide the LinkedIn's for all of our panelists and they do, they encourage you to connect with them. Anyone else right. have advice for students with getting into the industry? Conferences, that's how I got my interview at j, j I was a part of NABA, so the National Association of Black Accountants, um, and I was able to get an interview with j, j there. So if you have any, or like the IMA conference that's coming up, I think that's a great opportunity to get in front of um, those companies. Great, yes. And j, &J will definitely be at our student conference as well. Um, anyone else have any tips for that? Uh, it can also be LinkedIn, of course, is a, is a great tool. There are also some other uh, sources for part-time job, for example, where you can you can find positions with uh, in finance, but being able to work remotely and um, hire right is is one of them, and a couple others. For example, my startup job, I, I found this way. I was just like looking around, uh, what type of uh, seventy percent work I could find, and just um, Talking a little bit about myself and I found it just in, th in three weeks was really great and I couldn't expect a better outcome. Wonderful. And something I'll add to that, kind of what Danielle said, you know, she was part of NABA, which is the National Association of Black Accountants. That's also why even as students, you join an organization like IMA, because all of our panelists are members of IMA. This is how you build your network, being a student. And you're connected to people that are located all over the world. So that's one of the benefits of being part of an association like that. So with um, respect to time, I always like to ask this final question. And it is, what would your advice be to your younger self as a student? Or what would you like to tell students as they are looking to their future? So Danielle, I'll start with you. I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> 
related to CMA or just in general? <laughs> in general. In general. Ooh, that's tough. Um, definitely just put yourself out there more. I'm, I tend to be a little bit on the shyer side. Um, so just networking, go to events like this. Like I never would have participated in something like this when I was an undergrad. Um, so definitely keep taking advantage of this, like reaching out, add us on LinkedIn, do all of that great stuff. Like those are things I really wish I did when I was younger and had the opportunity to kind of like progress my career more. So definitely do that. Don't be like, <laughs> how about you, Tony? Uh, I would say kind of similar to Danielle said, like take risk, get uncomfortable because that's where you're going to grow the most. Um, I agree with you, Danielle. Honestly, I probably wouldn't have done something like this back in college as well. Um, but yeah, I would say take risks and just, just know like, working hard pays off just really just ask yourself like what do i have to do to like get to the next step and you most likely will have an answer for yourself whether it's like just networking more or studying or looking for a certification um i think if you just see yourself down and ask yourself certain questions you can help kind of paint the road of where you need to go and then from there it's just you know putting a lot of work and effort into it and, and good things will come great how about you keith um well, I can't say that I don't like to talk. I love to talk. So I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, but I will say one of the things that I I definitely would have changed is don't second guess yourself as much. Um, I feel like early on in my career, I was a little bit more hesitant about making moves. I think Danielle kind of touched on that. Um, really put yourself out there. Be willing to speak to people. Um I definitely would have took advantage of the scholarship. So uh, I paid out of pocket. My company, um, unfortunately, was not uh, looking forward to paying for me. So I ended up doing it on my own. But I would have taken advantage of definitely the scholarship. And I think building relationships. I think that more the more you look at it, the more relationships you have, the more you can move in different directions within your career. And finally, I would say the soft skills matter the further up you go. So it's not about, yes, you have to know what your job is and what your function is, but being able to communicate and do those soft skill things within an organization, those are what kind of pushes you to that higher trajectory. Wonderful. And last but not least, Yana? I think I'll recommend two things. One is challenge yourself and not be lazy to the extent like, uh, it will all pay out. Uh, an example would be a CMA, CMA exam, right? Taking these, investing time in yourself, and it will pay out definitely over years. And another one would be open to and linear uh, opportunities in your life, like and in your career. It should not always be like you know the step ladder up and a very logical one. Like in my case, I was I never knew I would kind of after finance go into accounting and after accounting of a big group I would go into startup and I will study from accounting of literally very manual work but then it will become basically C and then it will change again like and like being open a little bit and try different things and then you kind of will realize how it's all connected within finance that's what really good thing to consider this was all great and i hope the students got to hear a lot of different perspectives um and i'm going to turn it over to you tyler to send us home you're on mute <laughs> there we go <laughs> um so we just want to wrap up quickly so as keith mentioned definitely take advantage of the cma scholarship make sure that your professors are aware of this program for those that might not be quite ready to sit for the CMA exam, join IMA, take advantage of those courses and networking opportunities we have available, and then hopefully soon you'll be able to add CMA to your name. Um, we wanted to put up our contact info one more time. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Mary or myself, uh, connect with us on LinkedIn. And then finally, uh, we would like to thank our sponsor again for today, Glime Exam Prep, for making this presentation possible. And uh, Glime, we really appreciate all that you do for uh, not only IMA, but for the profession as a whole. So thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next time.